Good morning and a very warm welcome to our class today where we shall be looking at um, the first set of topics um, that we're going to learn to get started with programming. Um, if this is your first time to be attending this, my name is Paul and I will be your instructor for this course. I'll be taking you through the material. This is a Python level one course and in this course your, the objective is for you to build a foundation, a strong foundation on in Python programming. So the material that you learn in this course is essential uh, regardless of what field you want to go to. If you're going to become a software developer, if you're going to become a data scientist, if you're going to do machine learning and AI, um, if you're going to do science and engineering, bioinformatics, geoinformatics, any form of analytics, the material in this course is enough for you to have a nice solid foundation. Now, um, the way this course is structured, it's covered over seven weeks. Last week we had our first class in which I was introducing um, the ideas about why you should get into programming and how you should get into programming. And then in addition to that, I did a full walkthrough, I did a demo of what it, what a coding session actually looks like. From the time you start the project, you make changes, add that to a repository, share that repository, make changes, and go back and forth with the repository. Um, and then there were exercises. So all the students who are signed up for the class would get access to 10 programming challenges. Last week, since we were just doing an introduction, the tasks were to replicate what I had done and to just get your hands dirty on, on how to get started. And then there are 20 multiple choice questions which should only be attempted after you've done the programming challenges because they test your, your familiarity with the concepts. Um, the learning material is not, ex is not restricted to the videos and the material that is being, that will be available. Like right now, you probably would be watching this on YouTube. But the material is not restricted just to the videos. There's a lot of learning that happens through the programming challenges because there are things I don't have time to present as part of the videos. And there's only so much I can do in the videos. I just want to cover just the essentials. Um, but you also learn through the, the multiple choice questions because the multiple choice questions, the quizzes, have got certain tasks that need you to check the documentation and explore the documentation and just get a good understanding of, of how Python is and how Python works. And my, my belief is that by the end of this course, if you follow diligently, if you go through all the material, you will be in a very good position to um, have a strong foundation so that you can move on to the next level and, and, and do other things. My plan is that for the next course, we're going to talk about the next course after this, after the Python level one, that's going to be the Python level two, will all be about uh, object-oriented uh, programming. And I'm going to introduce the ideas of classes and how to work with classes, how to write classes, how to think about classes, some of the features that Python has that you can take advantage of to write nice, clean, idiomatic Python. So in this class, we are talking about, we'll get started with I.O. So we looked at it last week, but in, today we're going to go into a bit of detail. And then we're going to look at variables, we're going to look at types, we're going to look at uh, and operators. And uh, I promise it's going to be a nice class, you're going to enjoy this. All I ask is, after you've done, gone through the video, if you're signed up for the class, do the assignments or do the programming challenges and the quiz, because that's how you learn. It's a practical course. And there's no way you're going to learn anything if you just watch the videos. The videos are just a tiny part of what is available for you to learn. So, let's get started. We are on week two with, uh, I titled it IO, VARS, and OPS. So that covers a number of things. And I think... Uh, it's going to be helpful just to have a good understanding of what's going on, okay? So here we are. Oh, I need to make some changes to my slides. So forgive me while I do that. I need to resize this um, so that you can you can see me and also see the... Okay, I'm just going to add a crop filter. Yes. Okay. 
day. Right to the 1920 so that we can see that close. Mm -hmm. and then we go so that you can you can see both me and the slides. Okay, so with that out of the way, uh, let's get started. So the, today's class is going to be all about um, these three topics. We are looking at core I/O, which means input output. We're going to look at variables, and then we're going to look at types. And then we're going to look at basic operators, and then we're going to look at logical operators. And all of these are, are important parts for you to um, just to get started. And by the end of this class, you can write a sensible program that does something. And again, I really want to emphasize that in all the exercises, I would, I would strongly um, urge you to go through the whole process of creating a repository. Uh, so create the project, create the repository, uh, add the code, create the repository, and do all the sharing back and forth, add the license, add the git ignore. And the reason for this is that's just something you want to have on, on your fingertips. You want to do it over and over again until it becomes second nature. You can find your way around both uh, GitHub as well as PyCharm on working with Git. That's really, really important. You want to repeat that until you it's just a standard skill. You've standardized it and now you can think beyond that. Because for you to learn now the next level of Git where you start working with uh, branches, you need to have this down. And you'll not be able to do that if you're still you know, struggling to get Git up and running. I'd also strongly encourage you to try and use the command line uh, for Git. Uh, Git has got a bunch of commands. So there's Git push, Git pull, Git status. Those are the core functions, the core commands that you need to know. And being able to navigate around on the command line means that even when your PyCharm might you know, raise an error for one reason or another, you can still sort yourself out. Okay, so this is the outline of the course of the material for today. And But before we get into the material for today, let's talk about last week and we do a recap. Now, I'm not going to show the problems here. If you, did, if you went through the programming challenges and if you went through the quiz, then you'd be familiar with you know, what I will, I'll be talking about. Now, I have a number of points that I, I thought that would be important to highlight. As I mentioned, what you really want to do is don't touch the quizzes until you've done the programming challenges. And that's going to be even more important this week. I mean, it's, it's evident from some of the um, answers that some of the students have given. When, you know, when you're filling out the quiz, it's quite evident if you haven't uh, read, gone through the material. And if you haven't gone through the material, then it'll, it'll just show because you'll, you'll be guessing. And you don't want to be guessing. I mean, you want to build a skill, right? That's the purpose. That's the reason you're doing this. You don't want to deceive yourself by just going through the material and, you know, running through without really engaging. Engage with the material. It's there for you to learn. So I really urge you to do that. That's number one. Um, the second thing I'd say is this course is run over seven weeks. And I would strongly urge you, just give these seven weeks your best focus and your best attention. It's possible to get the time. I mean, if whether it means waking up early or sleeping late, um, you can do it. You can find two hours over three days. That's all you need, up to six hours. And you can have a really good understanding of by going through the material. Um, and it's all for your, to your advantage. So please allocate time. Treat the next six uh, weeks, the remaining six weeks, as special. Give them your best attention. And, and just do a good job and make sure that you, you, you learn something. This is a foundation. If you do a poor job with the foundation, you know, the rest of the building is going to be questionable. Second thing I wanted to, to, to point out, which might not be obvious, is everything is in the videos. So everything you need to solve the tasks I want to make it very clear throughout the videos. So if you watch the videos like this video, but there's also the getting started videos. The getting started videos have got everything you need to do to get, to get started. Now you might experience problems like if you're installing with Windows and Windows is misbehaving, uh, but just get in touch with me if you're in the class. Uh, you could write in the comments of the video below, um, but everything you need is in the videos. So you should be able to complete the tasks without a problem. As I said, and I'm going to say this for the third time, 
only attempt the quizzes after you've done the programming challenges, which is why the deadline for the quizzes is after the deadline for the challenges. The challenges are practical. You do something, you write code, but with the quizzes, it's just, it, I'm just testing that you, you have got certain key points. Now, from this week onwards, the quizzes are graded. They're going to be part of the grading for the course. So, um, if you, and you'll only have one attempt. You will not have a time limit. You'll have only one attempt because the way it's set up, for it to be graded, you only have one chance to fill it in. So, that's going to be an extra reason why you want to only go through the quiz after you've done the programming challenges. Um, and the, the quizzes would just test and expose more ideas. I've already said this, this, that there's only so much I can give in the videos and there's so much more that you can learn from the quizzes. So from the quizzes, you'll find certain exercises which are not difficult and I'll show you how to actually use the Python console to do that. It's quite straightforward. You shouldn't have a hard time with that. Um, so there's a lot more that you can learn from doing the quizzes. Okay, so that's uh, just a quick recap. I'm not going to go through the answers. I might then post a video. I'm not sure about this. If I have the time, I'll post a video where I'll, I'll look at some of the questions where I saw that students had a hard time, and then I'm going to um, just give you a, a clue on how to do that. Okay, so let's get started with core IO variables and types. So this is essential. This is like the most basic thing that you need to know. Once you know this, you can actually write a bare-bones Python program. Now, in terms of core I.O., one of the tools which I think is really, really powerful is the, the, the Python console. Now, I want to show you what the Python console looks like. And for me to do that, I'm going to just move to a different screen so that I can have my... Um, so... So here is PyCharm, and I've increased the size of the font, so I hope that's big enough for everyone. Now you'll notice right here at the bottom, right where my mouse is, there is the Python console. Now the Python console, if you click that, it's going to open this thing here, which shows you there's these three angle uh, brackets, the greater than signs. And what that allows you to do is write Python statements. You can write any type of Python statement here. And why would you need to know about um, how to use the Python console? Well, the Python console is very helpful in allowing you to just test certain things. And you'll find that this is helpful for the quiz. Within the quiz, you'll find there are questions that you can solve without having to write a complete program. And where would you do that? You do that in the Python console. So let's just look at a few things you can do. One of the most exciting things you can do with the Python console is to run import this. So I'm going to run import this. What this does when you run it, it prints out a little poem that was written by a guy called Tim Peters. It's called the Zen of Python. And this is what Python aspires to allow its users to do. So it talks about how what is expected of the code of a Python programmer. So there's beautiful is better than ugly, right? Beautiful code. Explicit is better than implicit. You want to make sure that the code looks like what it says it is doing so that the user can understand and can be very clear on what uh, the reader of the code can have a good idea of what the code means. Simple is better than complex. Now, that is a very loaded statement. Writing simple code is very hard. And go. you can go on and on, but that's one of the things you could do. You could run import this. Now, what we looked at from last week, we looked at the print statement. You could print strings. We don't look at strings today. You can just write numbers. You can do addition. So this, we're going to look at uh, operators. But this is a useful tool that you can use to, to enable you to test things out without having to write a complete program. The Python console is essential. It's a playground where you can experiment, play around, and, and just have an idea of what a function does, 
uh, you can see what kind of exceptions are raised. You can do what, what, whatever you want to do. It's, it's a very nice starting point. Now, so let's go back to, sorry. Um, okay, so let's start off with IO. Now, as far as IO is concerned, there are two fundamental functions you need to know. You need to know about the input function and you need to know about the print function. So let's, let's do this now with, within PyCharm. The input function, oops. So the input function, I'm going to close the, the console because we're not going to use the console now. So I've talked about the Python console um, and now we're going to talk about, let me just move this one up. Uh, I'm going to talk about the input function. So the thing about the input function is that it allows a user, once they run the program, to provide values into the program, okay? The one thing that you must always remember is that the input function only provides strings. We look at strings later on, but whenever you run an, um, the input function, whatever it provides, let's say if we say input s, if you don't provide any arguments and we run it, so let's go, we're going to run this. So I will, at the moment it's set to run a different program. So I come to the top right, let me turn off my video. I come to the top right here. You can see if I click run, it's going to run logical. So I have a bunch of functions here. I'm going to push all this to Git, GitHub so that you can pull and, 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 and see the material. But um, let, me, let me make my video visible so that I can then allow myself so that you can see me. So I just put myself here so that you can see me. So, so that I don't have that hidden. So if we run this right now, we'll be running logical. We don't want to run logical. We want to run echo. So that's the name of this for this module. And if I click run, so it says that it exited with exit code zero. Um, I don't know why I did that. Can't open the file. It should be able to see the file. Ah, I get it. Okay, I know. Okay, then. okay. It's a different echo. It's running a different one. Okay. So notice that I have a cursor blinking there. That's because when I said input, I didn't provide any prompt. But it's still ready to take in my input. So I can type in something and it's going to take it in. Now, we then can make it visible using print. So what we're going to do is we're going to say... Now we're going to say print, print s. And then we will, the third function we need to know is the type function. So we can also print the type of s. Now the type function, as we saw from last week, shows us the type of whatever variable it is we have, whatever object we have. Everything in Python is an object. I'm not going to go into the details of that now. But the, the right term, the correct term we can use is that it's an object. So we can make that, um, we can make whatever it is that we collected visible uh, by using the type and using the print. Okay, so let's run that now, now that we've made these changes. We run that again. Again, we don't have a prompt. We can change that the next time. And I'm going to give it, let's say, the number seven. Now, that's not a number. That's a string. So just because it looks like a number, that's the, the character for the number. But it's not the, it doesn't have any value. Um, let's add a prompt here now. So we're going to add a prompt here. And we're going to say um, S. So we, since we're asking for S, we'll say S. And you can put anything you want. You can make S with a question mark. So now when we run that, it has S with a question mark. And we can say 67. And 67 is a string. So these are the most important input and output functions. Um, there are a number of things you can do with them. For the input function, the, the most complex thing you can do is add a prompt. Beyond that, there's nothing else you can do. But for the print, print has got many, many arguments. So let's look at the documentation and see what the documentation says. So I'm going to move to my documentation page here. Um, in my documentation page, I can, let's go to the standard library. And we look at 
the built-in functions. So the built-in functions, this is where all the answers for all the quiz questions were. All you had to do was search this list and all the answers are here. That's how the quizzes are designed. They're designed in such a way that you don't, you don't need any special knowledge. You just need to follow what is, learned, what is from the videos, come to the documentation or whatever instructions are, are in the quiz question and you'll find all the answers. So now let's look at the print function. And the print function, that's what's called the print function signature. Print takes, so there's this special thing here with a star. This is called, um, so last week I, I said that these are, um, these are actually called keyword arguments because there's a keyword associated with them. You have to pass them using the word, for example, in this case, set. You must use set, you must use end for that. What this says, for when we say objects, those are called positional, positional arguments. The star in front of it simply says that if you give it a, a list, which we're going to look at next week, it's going to unpack the list. That's all it's saying. But it means that you can just provide a sequence of values separated by commas. So let's look at that. We're going to look at using, um, we'll, we'll see set and then we'll see end. Um, we'll skip the rest for now because we'll come to files in the last last class. I think it's going to be class six. So let's look at that. We have print there. Okay. Now we can give it several things. We don't have to only give it that. We could give it even a number, nine, another number, 32. Okay. So if you run this program again, it's going to ask us for S. We could say my name, Paul, and it's going to print out that. It's going to print out nine and 32. So we can use commas to separate different items in the print. Now notice that there are spaces between each of the values here. So there's a space between Paul and nine, nine and 32. The reason for that is because of SEP. SEP is by default a space. It doesn't have to be, you can change what it is. And now let's change that to a column. If we run this again, it's going to ask us for S. We're going to give it something. And when we run it, so now it's going to separate them with a column. So set allows you to change what it's going to use for separating. You could even use re replace that with an empty, an empty uh, pair of quotes. And if you run that again, now everything is glued together. So that's what set does. The other thing that we could change now is end. So end is a keyword argument. I'm going to write a new one here. So I'm going to say print one, two, three, four. Okay, for example. Now we are going to change this to end. We are going to add end and we'll make a change by default. End is what's called a new line character. So if you remember from the documentation, and is this special character. Now this special character, whenever you see a backslash, those are special characters and they are called escape sequences. The computer treats these as special. The backslash N is the symbol for a new line. Now, if you're running this on Windows, it might not be, it might make a slight difference. I don't know if they, they say it here, <clears throat> but on, a window, on Windows, for you to get a new line, you actually need two characters, not one. You need a backslash R and a backslash N. The backslash R character is called the carriage return. So what it does is it will take the cursor back to the beginning of the, um, to the, beginning of the line and then it will add a new line below that. Um, but on Linux and Mac, it's just a backslash N. I don't know if they've changed it on Windows. Maybe they have. So what that means is that anytime you use print with the default arguments, if you say print and you say print, it will always write those on new line. Let's see that in, in action. So here we have print that. We haven't told it what the value of end is. And notice when it printed out, it printed out they were next to, where were one line separated by another, which means 
there is an actual character here that is separating this line from that line. And that's the new line character. Now we could change the end, we could make it a space, for example. And if we do that, so if we have two lines, now I've just duplicated that line. And so I, I remove this one for, I remove that there. What do we expect? We expect that it's going to print that line, one, two, three, four. And then it's going to put a space and then it will continue the, 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 the next print. And then since this one has the default end as a new line, it's going to give us a new line. So we can, we can actually duplicate this again so that we see all that. So you could try this out um, later on. <clears throat> so let me run that. It asks us for S. We put some rubbish. So let's look at the output here. So we have our, our value here, which had got sep as, as, a, as a blank um, string. Then we printed out the type of S. And then we had a new line. And then we printed one, two, three, four. And then we added a space. And then we continued one, two, three, four. And then this one, line 13, then added a new line, which went to one, two, three, four, which then added a new line. So the, it ends up at that point. So we could change that. Let's change that to another character. We could change it into multiple characters. It doesn't have to be just one character. We could change it into dash, less than, less than, dash, dash, um, um, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, dash, dash, that. I mean, we could run this. Nothing that stops us from doing that. Um, and then we type something in and look, that's what it's added as the end. So those are the most important arguments. It allows you, it gives you a lot of flexibility on what you can do when you're printing. Those are two very important things. So what have we learned from this? We have seen how you can give it multiple values separated by commas, that's number one. Second, is we've seen the keyword argument of sep, and that's from the documentation. The third thing is we've seen end, which is the character at the end of each um, print statement. Now, we used s here. s is a variable. A variable is a name that you assign some value. We assign it using the equal sign. Now, anytime you use equal, you're doing an assignment. So this is called an assignment. Let's just write. So this is assign some value to variable. S. So that's what we've, we've just assigned. Uh, we won't go into the details of what is actually happening in the computer. As far as you getting some code running, that's all you need to know. Now the next question we need to be asking ourselves as far as variables is concerned, so let's just, I have a couple of points here about variables. There are several things to be aware of when you start working with variables. So for one is, there are special names that Python reserves for itself. It doesn't stop you from using them, but if you do, then your program will not function correctly. These words are called keywords. And keywords are all available. I'm going to show you where they are. We'll go to the documentation. So let's look at this in the documentation. And, oh, I should not be here. Yeah. Let's look for the keywords. Now, you find the keywords in the documentation, you have to go to, to the main documentation page and we go to the language reference. And within the language reference, there is this section here, identifiers and keywords. Um, oh, that's probably not going to be very helpful. Okay, yeah, there we go. That's the keywords that Python has. Now notice how many are there? These are seven times four times five. There are 35 keywords. These 35 keywords are reserved for Python. They have, they are used exclusively by Python. Python doesn't stop you from using them, but using them will break your code. Your code might not break in the way you think it will break, but it will make your code buggy. And all these words are special. So let's, um, we've seen, have we seen any of them so far? Um, I think I used pass before. We've seen import. Import is used for importing things. Um, assert, with async, del. We've seen def. Def is used for defining functions. 
If you looked at last week, we had the if statement, which was used for the discriminant, if you remember. And I think that's all. I don't think we used, did anything. Else. Oh, we did. We did look at none. None is we used none return value of none when we had um, the discriminant was less than zero. So those are keywords. Never use them as a variable. I would strongly um, advise you not to. So let's go back to thinking about variables. How, what? How do you define good variables? Well, there are very simple rules. I mean, you can have very complex rules, but the simple rules are use the characters that are highlighted there in blue, which are from, use small letters, capital letters, underscore, zero to nine. Never start a variable with a number. That's gonna fail. Um, we don't have to go into that. You can start with an underscore. Underscores are special, and we'll look at this when we when we, in the next course, Python level two, where we shall start looking at um, uh, classes, the underscore is special. You can have a variable that is only called underscore. That's fine. Um, so underscore is an admissible character. Anytime you use uppercase only, and let's, let's do this, let's do a demonstration of this. Anytime you use uppercase only, you are going to, that will be, um, what's called a global variable. It's just a convention. It doesn't make it special. It's just a way of communicating to the reader of your code that this variable at the global scope, and I'll explain what that is, is special, okay? So anytime you use uppercase, you would use it in the global scope. The global scope is where you have zero indents. Anything that is at the zero indent point is called a global scope. So for example, this function main it's at the global scope, which means that everything in this module can see this function. You could have something in a local scope. You could have a function inside here. There's nothing that stops you from doing this, my function. There's nothing that stops you from doing that. You can actually do that. But that's now within the local scope of the function. Only the, the, the members and variables within this function will be able to see that function. So this is called the local scope, and you can keep even going deeper and deeper and deeper. You can have a local scope within a local scope and a local scope within a local scope. You can keep doing that as long as you want. Python doesn't prevent you from doing that. But I just want to make the distinction between the local scope and the global scope. So if you wanted to have a variable up here, you could have it and let's say you could say um, uh, length. And you could say length is 24, okay? So here we have a, a variable which is global, and this global variable we highlight it by the uppercase. But then typically you're not going to be doing that, you'll be having variables within. I, I would strongly suggest avoid global variables because they can get very confusing. Try and keep everything local. And we want to use lowercase for local variables. A good way of naming a variable is to make it obvious what that variable is. Now, when we looked at the quadratic equation, in the quadratic equation, since the equation is in terms of x, then having x as the var variable, it's that's a meaningful thing. The, the user or the reader of that code would then say, ah, ah it's kind of obvious what this is. We are solving for x. We have found x. There are two values of x. There's an x1 and an x2. But in other cases, you'll, you'll be doing things, you'll be processing data which is not necessarily obvious. So, for example, if you're asking a user for their name, you'd say, and we don't do it in lowercase, name is equals to input, and then you put name. Okay? Now, anyone who reads this code will know that this is a name. Sorry, Paul, we can't see the editor. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay, yeah, there we go. Sorry for that. Yeah, so... Um, did you miss all that about global variables? Yeah, you probably did. So global variables, as I said, are global variables are here at the top because this is the global scope. Um, and then the local scope is inside a function or inside, we'll see for loops and if loops and while, if, if statements and while, while loops. 
because this variable name here is inside a function, we say that this is inside the local scope of that function. But if something is global, then it's seen by everything within that uh, module because it is globally visible. In that case, then it makes sense to use uppercase for key constants. If you have a constant or something that is going to be needed by everything in the module, then using uppercase is sensible. But if it's within the local scope, then you just want to use um, a lowercase for that. So here we have name is equals to input name. That will be obvious to anyone who's running the code that the, this variable is handling a name, okay? And you could also have something like age, input age. Now, since age is a number, we might need to change that into an integer, and you would do that with a cast. You call the int function on that, but we're going to see that in a short while. You could do that after you've taken the variable in. But the point that we are making right now is that your variables need to have sensible names. And try to keep the names, try to keep them reasonably short. You don't want a name that is 40 characters long. But at the same time, if you're dealing with a really large program where you have a lot of things are going on, then it might be sensible to have a variable that has got a slightly longer name. So for example, if you're processing, let's say, data about you know, sports, and you have, let's say, um, a number of games lost. That's a sensible variable. So it would be obvious what that variable need, means. Um, and what people tend to do is they try and abbreviate. So you could, let's say, say no of games lost. That's also okay. It's better to be explicit. Another thing you could do there is you might say num of games lost. But it, it's obvious what's going on. It's obvious that this variable is collecting the number of games lost. So the naming of your variables is important. Um, okay, so that's it about variables. Three points, avoid keywords, use the characters that are shown, never start with a number, and good variables are descriptive and they are sensible within the context of what is being analyzed. There are global variables and local variables. Try and keep away from global variables unless you really, really need something that affects everything in your program. And if you use global variables, try to keep them global without changing them. Um, but it's better to always use local variables, and those will be with lowercase, and they try and make them descriptive so that anyone who's reading the program can understand what's going on. Okay, so that's it about variables. Now let's look at types. We've already looked up the type function. The type function is very important because it allows us to see the types of things. It, there are other things it does, but this is perhaps the most important thing for us who are getting started now with, with, uh, with Python. We want to know what the type, the type is. And we saw from last week, one of the ways that it helps us is it allows us to do what's called debugging which means make things visible, make things expose the bugs or the, the parts of our code that are not functioning correctly or that are not functioning as intended. And one of the most important things you can do when you're debugging is to do print statements. You want to print and see why did this part go wrong? So you remember last week we saw we had a trace back. In that trace back, we could see the program started here, then it went to this part, then it went to this part, and then it failed at this part. And when we click at that part, we can then say, we can add a print statement. The type function allows us to see what things are. So we can print what num of games lost is, and we can print what the type of num of games lost is. So if we run this, we can then see, oh, so name, oh, I can put in something, and it's an age, and I say 22. Oh, so that's an integer. Ah, now we know it's an integer, okay? That's very helpful. And a lot of times you're going to, if you have a type error or a value error, it will likely be because we are giving it the wrong kind of thing to process. So that's what the type is for. Um, okay, we talked about good variable names. Okay, 
Um, so now let's look at the actual types. There are five types that we're going to look at today. Integers, floats, booleans, non-type, there's only one non-type, and strings. Let's start off with integers. Integers, as you know them from mathematics, are either positive or negative whole numbers. So if x is 32, that's an integer. We could make it minus 32. Now, that's an example of a unary operator, and you'll see them later. The minus there obviously does what it says. And x, you can print the type of x. The type of x is, so let me let me stop all this. I'm going to stop this because we have all these. Uh, I just comment these out so that we don't keep getting stopped. I just want to run all the way till the end. So s is not defined. Okay, so that's a name error. That's a type of an exception in which we are referring to a name that has not been initialized. So there it tells us that that is an integer. If you want to write a float, a float is going to be written with any number that will have a decimal point or any number that involves an operation involving a, decimal, a number with a decimal point. So if I had y is equals to um, x, we know x is an integer times two points. You can actually only have one point. You don't even have to have the whole you know, point something. That should evaluate. Now, y will be the result of an internal float, and that will be a float. So let's run that. And there you go. It's a floating point. Floating points are, they, they have a certain amount of precision. I think there's a limit on how much you can add. Um, can actually print the value of y. You run that. So there's a certain number of decimal places. And there are some things you can do with floating points. You can round them off. And I think you can get the number of significant places. Um, you have to check on the documentation for that. Let's just look at that. If you go back to the functions, do we have we have a round, we have a round function. Um, but I don't think we have a significant places. Okay. Number of C. So the round function tells you, you give it a number and you tell it the number of digits. So let's do that. So that's a very large number there. And we can we can round it off so we can say print. We are going to round y to four decimal places, for example. And there we go. It has rounded off correctly because this value is five here and it just rounds it up. <clears throat> So that's it for floating points. So as far as numbers is concerned, it's quite straightforward. If you're doing calculations involving integers and floating points, you'll end up with floating points. Now, integers and floating points, and we're going to see this with bool and string, they are not just types. So here we say that this is of class int and class float. There are also functions. So there's a function called int, so let's look at that. There's a function called int here. And what int does, there are two ways you can use int. You can use int with a number only. Or you can use int with a keyword argument called base. And it returns an integer object constructed from a number or string x. So it has to be a real number, either a floating point or whatever kind of number it is, or a string of that number. So let's look at that. So suppose you have, and this is what we do. So for whenever we use the input function, the input function always gives us a string and we use the int function to convert it to that. So we could just do that directly, int of five or six. If you print that, that's going to be, let's give that a, a variable. So we call that w for example. And we're going to print w and the type of w. Now, initially, w here was a string. We know it's a string because of the quotation marks. 
and so we'll see what we get and we get that it's six and it's an integer now if you try that on something that is not an int like y what will it tell us it will tell us you have a value error you give it a value that cannot be converted to an integer let's look at the keyword that it we saw with that there is the base now by default we use we do numbers in base 10 we count up to 10 and once we get Actually, we start from 0 up to 9, and then we have an overflow to 10. So we go 1 to 10, and then 11 to 20, that's base 10. You can also do math in binary, and that's what the integer function can do. So you can print a number, if you want to see the number, 64, in binary. You tell it base 2. And when we run that, oh, sorry, uh, int, it will be int, and we're going to print... Uh, int can convert non string with explicit base. Ah, ah, so it has to be a string. Interesting. Let's see, let's see that if that works. Ah, print int. Aha, so we have a problem. So 64 has got characters that don't fit in with binary. So what if we gave it 11? Well, what looks like 11? Uh, let's see what that looks like, whether that runs. It does. So the key idea here is that if you're going to use base, then you're going to use base, but you have to keep in mind that you're using characters correct for that base. Um, if you're familiar with hexadecimal, hexadecimal numbers are numbers that have 0 to 9 and then A to F. So a valid hexadecimal number would be like if we said, um, so... So let's do int um, and we want a number f f and we are going to do it's going to be in base 16 okay because that's what hexadecimal is you don't need to know this i'm just showing this in case you have an application that will require this and that's the number 255 if we give it a character that is not in that in that range of values for base 16 so if you added g for example it's going to give you a value error because it, the G is not one of the characters that are, are accepted. Now you can play around with that, but that's the other argument for int. What about float? Well, float, you can make numbers with float. So if you now enter number W is equals to, we are overwriting our W, let's see now use V is equals to float. Again, you can give it a string, 7.3328. You're going to find you'll need to do this if you are processing data that's, for example, in a CSV file or a text file, which has got numbers, and you need to extract the values and calculate with them, then since whatever is written into the file will be strings, you'll need to convert them into float. So if you print V, and we're going to print the type of V, initially we know we started off with a string because we had the quotes. If we run that, with 7.3328 and that's a float. Let's see if there are other arguments that go with float. So if we look for float, float only takes a string or a number. Now you could get the float of an integer, which means you want to change an integer. So if you have an integer, um, you could get the float of one. We know one is an integer. So if we get the float of one, it converts it to 1.0. And you might need to do that in certain cases. Okay, so we've looked at int and we've looked at float, those are the two most important numeric types. Integers are when you're doing counting, um, floating points and when you're doing um, arithmetic which requires precision. Now, let's talk about bool. Bool is a type, if you look at the documentation, bool is a so there is a bool function okay but there is also the bool type so let's just look at this in the documentation so the documentation tells us in terms of uh, boolean values so in terms of truth values <clears throat> um
I don't I don't have that here. Let's just constants. Yes. So these are the Boolean types. There are only two types of Booleans. There is true and false. This is a false value of the bool type. There's only there's one bool type, but there are two values it can take. A false value and a true value. Okay? If you try and assign to false, assignments to false are illegal and raise a syntax error. So false is fixed, it's a keyword, and that's what we saw from the beginning. So let's look at, at some examples of that. First of all, there is the literal false. So print false. If we print false, we see false. And if we look at the type of false, notice the spelling, it has a capital F. False is of type bool. And we could do the same with true. You can, if you run that, again, true is type bool. And those are the only two types. So bool has got two values. There's a bool type with two values, true and false. Now, since we have a bool function, it tells us we can convert some other values into bools, which means you convert them into true or false. So let's look at some examples. Suppose uh, we wanted to convert the number one, okay? And we did bool of one, and we got b is a bool of one. We can print what b is. We can print the type of b. Let's see if this is going to run correctly. So there we go. It says, if you have a value of one, and you get the bool of that, b becomes value true, okay? And that's what we printed here and it's of type bool. What about if we do the same for zero? So if we have b is equals to bool, I'm just overwriting the variable b. It means that from this point onwards, the value of b will be the last assignment that I have done. So if I did zero, and then I did print the value, the b and the type of b, and we ran that, now um, it is false. So before it was true, you see here, now it is false. So zero evaluates to false. What about three? Let's try another number and see what happens. So if b is equal to bool of three, and we print b, um, the type of b. So let's, let's, be, let's do something better here. Let's use an f string so that we can see what we're actually doing. So f quote, uh, b is equals to, and then we'll see the value of b, and then with the type of b, okay? So all I've done there is I've added an f string, and in that f string I've said we have b and we have put the value of b inside braces, so that we can see when b is different things. So now we see uh, b was, yeah, so b is true, b is false, and b is true when it is three. And the moral of this is, and let's try it with minus 3 or minus 1. So I'll just copy, I'll just duplicate this, and I'll just replace this with minus 1. Um, again, it is true. The moral here is, whenever you want to get 0 evaluates to false, and any other number any any value any number evaluates to true and you'll see this in next week when we look at lists and uh, and tuples that's an important way of evaluating whether a list is empty or not it even applies for strings but we look at that later on the, the key point here is that for booleans there are only two values we can change something else into a boolean and when we change something else into a boolean it will get the value either true or false. It will only be false if we have zero. I've never tried this with floating points. You can I'll leave that for you as an exercise. Okay, so we have not much time to go. The next thing we're going to look at is the none type. So we've looked at float, we've looked at bool, and we've looked at and now we look at none. Now none is a special type. It's, there's only one none type and there's only one none value. 
and none simply means no value. That's all it means. So none is frequently used to represent the absence of value. If you have a function that doesn't return anything, we say it returns none because there is no value it returns. And it's an actual thing, so you can assign it. So let's do that. So if we have n is equals to none, we can print n and we can print the type of n. So n is none and it's none type. And that's it. There's nothing else that can be made into none. Um, that's all there is. <laughs> so that's straightforward. Now the one which we'll need to spend a lot of time on is on strings. Because strings are very rich. Because strings are actually now proper objects. All the others were objects. But now we have objects which have methods. Which means we can do things on them. And a lot of the exercises are going to, going to introduce you to this. So there are two ways, there are three ways of defining a string. Well, actually, there are maybe four ways of defining a string. Three ways of defining a string. But we, we only need to know, we need to know three of them, okay? Anytime you create a string, you have to use quote marks. Now, whether you use single quotes or double quotes, it doesn't matter. So it should be possible to do something like this is, and then we can stick another one on top together, and we can say a string. And you print out S. And so that shows you that quotation marks in Python don't, it doesn't matter. Okay, not like in C. In C, a single quote is for a character, a double quote is for a string. But there's one other way you can do it. You can use triple quotes, either triples made of single quotes or triples made of, um, of, of double quotes. And this is important for doc strings. If you saw from last week, doc strings are how we do documentation. So let's have capital S is equal to triple quote. And you notice PyCharm filled that in for me. And I can write something interesting. So write something interesting. And then now notice what I'm going to do. I'll have an enter. And I can have a multi-line string. So there is nothing to be concerned about. And if we print out S, it will come together with all those, all those new lines because here, where we had this jump, that's a new line. It'll include it. It'll also include this tab here and this tab here so that it'll be tab. And therefore, you need to take into account these multiple tabs. You can also use F string for both of them. But let's just look at this. If you print S, so you see it started off right at the beginning where it started, which is right here. And then it got till the end of interesting. And then it jumped down and added this line here. And when it got to the end of that line, it jumped down again and added the tab or the spaces here, which is why we have this. And then it got till the end, again, added another space. So there's, there's actually a chunk which is hidden from our view there. It's invisible. So that's, that's how you use strings. We've already seen examples of using F strings. F strings are a nice way to integrate values into your strings. So if you have a string S, you can say F is uh, my name is and you can put anything um, my name is you can put another string inside Paul okay it's just a bit confusing but and my age is and I can put and I can put a number here five or I can put a variable with a value I can call a function I can do anything inside here once I have f all I can I can make that string into a string and fill in all the values by putting Anything that returns a value there. It's a bit more complicated than that, but that's, that's just a good starting point. So let's print this string with the, with the values here. If I print S, it says my name is Paul and my age is 5. Okay. <clears throat> now, as I said, strings are objects. They're very rich objects because there's a lot of things you can do with strings. What we are going to do is we are let's look at the methods available on strings. Strings are a very rich data type. You can do tons and tons of things with them. So this is the section of the documentation where it talks about strings. And in this part of the documentation, it's telling you what I've already told you. You can use single quotes, double quotes, and you can mix them. Single quotes, double quotes. Triple quotes span multiple lines. We have seen that. 
and string literals are part of a string expression and only have white space between them. Okay, uh, so you can you can put uh, you, you can read through all of this. What I want to show you now is the the so oh yeah, there's also the string function. Let's look at that, and we look at some some um, arguments that are passed to that. <coughs> so remember, we we took a string and converted it to a number. We did that for um, integers, and then we did that also for the binary. You remember when we use base? In that case, we move from string to int. We can actually move back from int to string. So if you have some value, which is a number, something, we can make it into a string using this, the string um, argument. So we say v under s, which means the string value of s, and I could just apply string on V. And now if I print them, you'll not be able to tell the difference because the, the process of printing actually converts numbers into strings. But um, we'll know that explicitly if we print V under S and the type of V under S. If we run that, we'll see that now that value is actually a string. You could do the same for floating points. You could do the same for booleans. So let's try that with a boolean. So if I have b is true and n is none, and I could say print, let's just print the string value of, of b. Oops. The string value of b, we'll just see what the output is, and the string value of n. And if we run that, we see strings. But they're actually, we see they appear the way they would, but they, they are actually strings now. I mean, we could print the type, let's just do that, the type of that. And when we run that, we see that they are strings. So not only can we move from an integer to a string, from a string to an integer, we can move back. And we can do the same with Booleans, provided they are valid. I mean, if you try and get a Boolean out of something that can't be a Boolean, I think you get a problem. So, for example, you could try and say, try and get the Boolean of none. See what happens when you do that. That, that should evaluate to false, I think. So, let's look at string methods. So, um, so typically, uh, for a string function, you'd give it an object, which would be, it could be quoted. Um, it's a special case where you are doing an encoding. There are some fun exercises that I've created for you where you'll be doing some encoding and decoding to understand the key ideas behind the Unicode. It's, they're not difficult, just try them out. And they're fun, I think you'll enjoy them. Um, so the second case is where you want to do some encoding or decoding. I won't go into that right now. But let's look at the methods. There are many, many methods. I, I, I haven't counted them, but there are over 20 methods. Anytime you have a string, you're going to have, you can access the methods using the dot operator. The dot operator simply says, this is an object, and we can call the method, it's a function tied to the object that only works on that object. Now, one way to think about it, we're going to go through this in the Python level 2 class when we talk about classes and objects. But just for you to understand about the core ideas behind objects is objects give you a way in which you can bundle up the description of a thing together with the actions that happen on that thing. So take, for example, something like a pen. A pen is a thing, and a pen has got certain attributes about it. So it has a color. Suppose it's a blue pen. That, that is an attribute of the pen. Now, the pen can do certain things, and those things that it can do are captured in its methods. So a pen can write, and therefore we'll have a write method. Uh, a pen um, might have, I don't know, what, what special things. You can open up the pen if you want to replace the ink. So it might have an open method. Whenever you see methods, methods are verbs. They are action-oriented. Um, attributes are descriptive. 
they are like you know color size and material they are descriptive of the properties of of that thing in the same way strings are objects and strings have attributes so a string has a length a string has a string has got an encoding um, a string could have attributes regarding the kind of characters that are in it are they numbers are they numeric characters are they um, only letters are they a mixture of number and letters are they uppercase are they lowercase those are attributes of the string so from the documentation anytime you see str str simply stands for not just the string class but any member of the string class string class and let's look at an example of this let's make it practical um, so there are many many methods capitalized with a description of what it does case fold center count you have to read them and just follow what it says there they are very well explained it shouldn't be difficult to make sense out of them but let's see that in practice so we're going to eventually look at this in the context of splitting a string and um, we should introduce you to some other interesting ideas but let's just start off with a plain string so s is a string and we'll put it my name paul Korea. okay now s is the string object print s type s there we go paul Korea is an object of the class string so whenever you see class now that should make sense now we are talking about an object which belongs to this class of it belongs to this class class is simply saying that there is a standard way that this thing is described and an object is just a member of that class it's like an individual just like you would have you have the class of doctors but there's a particular doctor um with a certain name that doctor is a member of the class of doctors so the same thing s is a member of the class of strings and that means it's got all the methods and attributes one of the things we could do is we could get the length of the string and we use the len function which if you look in the the, the the functions available in python we could print the length of a string and if we run that it tells us that that string has 10 characters 1 2 3 4 with a space 5 6 7 8 9 10 10 characters and we could do interesting things now with the string we could print s and now we can access the attributes the the, the method so let's start off with with uh, capitalize the first one there s dot capitalize and and pycharm will will provide that automatically so what does that look like it has so it's different it has only changed one character and that's what capitalize does so let's look at the description it says return a copy of the string with its first character capitalized and the rest lowercase okay uh, what if we wanted to make it um, all uppercase well print s and we have to look for well pycharm provides a helpful drop down there you can see and we can look at all the methods this is all the methods that are available and there's one method called upper so we'd have to look for upper you'd have to read through these i would strongly suggest spend some time just understanding what functions are available and try out different things and if we run that and now it prints it as with uppercase so there we have invoked that method some methods take arguments so let's find one that takes an argument so here look at this one um, center uh, it takes a width and a fill character the fill character is optional there's a default provided but the width is telling us if you want the string centered you have to tell it where is it being centered on what's the space that it's being centered on so let's try that we say print s dot and we'll say center and it's there it's asking us for the width and we tell it let's say 40 okay 
Now, that might not be obvious. So look what it's done. It's sort of moved it. We don't know where it, it ends. And that's why we can give it the fill character. So we can give it a fill character of, uh, let's say, exclamation mark. And if you run that, now it's much more obvious how it is centered. One special one that I'd like to bring your attention to is the split um, method. Now, this is used time and time again. If you're going to process data from a file, usually the file will have each row will have the data separated by some character. There are usually two main types of two ways of doing this. You either use the comma, and if you have comma, it ends up being a CSV, where the C in CSV stands for comma, comma separated values. Or it might be you use a tab character instead. Now, a tab character is one of those special characters that we saw before. So let, let's look at an example of that. Um, so if you print, let's look at the, I'll write a, a, a string and I'll say, I'll do an F string and I'll say Paul Correa. So imagine that this was a, a file and it had rows for everyone. Then we add a tab which had some value for, I don't know, his date of birth, 6th of, of uh, March 1942. And then another tab, where was he born? He was born in Mumbai. And another tab, and we're going to see how this looks like. And um, maybe a dash, there's something missing there. And another tab for, he's interested in Python. And he works at uh, some company X. So this would be an example file. And if we run that, so that's what it would look like. It would have nice spaces between them. And that just makes sure that when you open the file, you can actually... Um, distinguish the different columns. That's better than using commas. I, I think it's better than using commas, but commas are really popular because from tools like Excel, you can save directly as CSV or you can read directly as CSV. So suppose this was a string. So I'm going to convert this into a variable and I'm going to give it like the name. So this is a row. Uh, oh, that's strange. Okay, I just cut and paste this. I'll cut this and I'll call this row. So this is a row from a file. Okay, and if you print row, that's what we get. It does exactly what we do. But now we are going to do something else. We are going to get um, the data is row dot split, and our character there is the tab character. We have to give it the tab character. So what we're going to do is we're going to print what the data looks like and then we're going to print the type of the data. Now, this is material we're going to cover next week, but I just want you to see um, what you could do. So what it has done here, it has changed it into, you see these brackets here, and then you see a set of strings separated by commas and then another bracket at the end. Now that is a list. So what it's done is it has separated them and put everything into this list. So this list now has individual items. Now, one of the things you could do with that, if you count, you have one, two, three, four, five, six fields. You could, in, in, in this case, what we've done is we've put them all into a list. But you can also unpack the list if you want to get individual variables. So let's see how that works. So I want to get the name. I want to get the date of birth. I want to get the city. And I want to get something else. I want to get um, like height, for example. The, the height was not available. And, and interest. And I want to get uh, work, okay? And I could do the same, row dot split. The only thing is I have to make sure in the simple case, that I have as many variables here as the number of fields. There is a way you could do it without making sure that they are matched. But I just want to illustrate here that when you use a split function, you can, the split method, you can use it to unpack a string. And so let's do that and let's print now, uh, we could print a name, we could print them separately, date of birth, uh, we could print the city. Let me just correct that there. 
we could print the height and we could print the interest and we just do that interest and work and we can run that and look it's treated each of them are now an individual variable and that's very handy if you want to if you want to eventually process some of them in, in different ways so that's another one of the really important methods let me find it on the page split and that's the the argument that it takes the separator and max split returns a list of the words but you can unpack them if you want okay so that's it for the first part we've gone through the main types we look at the type function and how important it is and how it helps us in debugging we've used the print function a lot if you've seen we've done a lot of printing We've looked at int, float, bool, nan, and string, and we've seen how to use the corresponding functions, which can take different types and convert them into that type. So um, now, and then we've looked at methods. We've looked at, I, I showed you the upper. There's also lower. Then there's also split. So that's a good point for us now to transition from that to basic operations. Okay, if you have any questions, please note them down. We'll go through them after the at the end of the class. Now, we what we have here, so that's it for echo. I'm going to commit this. Uh, I'll say um, details on on print on IO and vars and types. And I will commit and push, and you can pull it later on. It's available for you to pull. Okay. So now that one is done, we are going to now look at operators. As far as operators is concerned, there are the standard operators that we are all familiar with. The ones that we know in math. Remember, computers are primarily or mainly used for computing. It's only recently that we now think of them doing non-mathematical tasks but um, they they mainly work with numbers okay uh, they mean initially so the operators are that are available on your keyboard if you look at your keyboard you're going to have uh, you know multiplication sign i don't know if that's visible there's a multiplication sign and there's addition and division and subtraction those come standard on your keyboard whenever you do operations you do operations on what are called operands. The things that are operated on are operands. And they don't have to be numbers. Just because we are using a plus sign doesn't mean we are only using numbers. We saw an example of this when we did the sticking together two strings. We, that's called concatenation. In that case, you use a plus operator to join two strings. Let's look at some examples of putting this into action. So we've already seen an example of this um, when we did the solution to the quadratic equation. So if we have x is equal to 1 and y is equal to 2, we could print x plus 1, x plus y, and we get, uh, okay, so I need to now run this one. So let's just run x. Okay, so it, that's what we expect. x plus 1 is 3. We can do multiplication, print x times y, we can do division, we can do um, subtraction, print x minus y. Okay, All these are as you'd expect them to be. Just one thing I should draw your attention to is, notice at 0 0.5, that's the only one that resulted in a float. So whenever you do division, it's unsurprising that you'll end up with floats. You actually you'll always end up with floats. In previous uh, Python version, it, it wasn't really necessary. You had to import something extra for that to work. So it's great that they've now just made it straightforward. Division returns floating points guaranteed. Whenever you work with operators, if you remember from your 
primary school days, we came across there was something called board mass. I, at least that's what um, we were taught. It's brackets of division, multiplication, and uh, sub uh, addition, subtraction. In other words, there is an order in which operators are applied. Now, the same applies. You know, this is called operator precedence. Certain operators bind tighter to, to others. So let's look at an example of this. If I said x, um, so let's add another variable here. So we're going to add a z. Let's say z is 7. I just want an ugly number so that it is. z is equals to 7 because it, it will produce strange values. If I say x plus y times 7 times z, it's not going to do the addition first, even if the addition appears first. What we expect to see as the result is y times 7, which is 2 times 7, 14 plus 1. We expect to see 15. And that's correct. Now, if you don't want that to happen, if you want the addition to happen first, then you have to have brackets. So brackets are the way in which you can apply some precedence. This was a solution to the first question of the, the first uh, programming exercise. You needed to put brackets somewhere. I won't tell you where, but uh, if you didn't complete the, the task, that's the solution is around that. And now what we expect is the value would be different. X is one, Y is two, that's three times seven. We expect 21 and that's correct. So brackets are very important. They're actually called parentheses. That's the correct name, but um, um, yeah, so there we go. Those are the main operators. However, when you look at your class notes, which will be available, they should be available shortly. Um, they, the material um, shows that there are many, many more operators. So there are operators for if you want to do integer division, for example. Um, so let's look at an example, a quick example of that. So if I do print of... 2 and I divide by 7, that gives us a certain value. So notice the value there is 0. That's called integer division. I'm very short on time now, so um, I'll just, I'll, I'll go straight to the point here. So integer division, and there are other operators. Um, so there is the modulus operator, 2 divide by 7, and that will give you what was what was the remainder. So this is uh, the modulo operator. And if you run that, we now get 2. So when you divide, how many in full numbers do you get when you divide 2 by 7? You don't get any, which is why it says 0. How many remain when you divide 2 by 7? Well, nothing goes into 7 fully, but 2 remain, and that's why you get 2. As we said before, like strings, I'll just do this here, print, if you have a string, and you add another string, I'll put a different character, and you put them together, it sticks them together and without adding any spaces. So that's, the operator can apply to different things, different objects. So that's as far as you need to go um, with operators. Those are the main operators. You've applied them in numeric case, and I've shown you an example in a non-numeric case. Um, so that's those are the main. So now let's look at logical operators. As far as logical operators concerned, there's just one key idea that you need to remember. Logical operators. Whenever you do logical operations, you're always returning a boolean. Remember, boolean had two values: true or false. So it will always return one of the two. Okay. There are two ways we can do uh, logical operators. We can do comparisons, and then we can combine comparisons. We can do compound comparisons. And for that, for compound comparison, we use the, the keywords at the bottom. So let's start by comparing values. So first of all, I'll just commit this and um, show operators, and I will push. Okay. So that should now be available. 
when you do the proof. So let's look at logical operators. So logical operators, as I said, they only return um, true or false. Let's look at an example. If I have x is equals to 3 and y is equals to 14, I can ask the question, is x greater than y? What do we expect? Well, it'll be a Boolean. It'll either be true or false. And therefore, in this case, we know it's going to be false. Let's run this. We say run, and it gives us false. That's what we expected. So um, you could check that. So we have them up here. So this is a comparison for equality. This is different from the assignment. Assignment, we only have one equal sign. But in comparison, we have more than one equal sign. We could check if uh, calculation returns a value which is the same as a certain value. So if we print that 3 times, so x times y is equals to, so here we expect it to be 42, I think. Is that equal to 42? We can ask, are they equal? And if we run that, it says true. That's correct. Uh, we can do something else. We can say, um, we can check if they are not equal to, and that's the sign that you have there. We want to print whether x times y is not equal to 2 times x uh, plus 3y times y. Okay? That's just an arbitrary one. Okay? So we are checking whether they are not equal to each other, and let's see... It's true that they are not equal to each other. And then there's the less than. We've looked at the greater than. There's greater than or equal to. Then there's less than or equal to. Whenever you do a comparison which has to do with identity, ident um, so this is and is not are usually applied for none. But they, are, they could also be applied on other types. But for now, we'll just use them for none. So when we use them for none, we, we, we would say, um, so suppose you, let me give a, a dummy function here. I'll just do a dummy function here. Def dummy. And I'm going to return nothing. I'll just say pass. Okay. And I'm going to get some value v is equals to the result of running my dummy function. Okay. We'll look at functions at the end, but this is just to illustrate something. And I can ask, print, just tell us. If V is none, that's how we would compare with none. And if we run that, we say, yeah, that is true. That's the value you see here. That is true. And suppose our function was now returning the value, return 3. We could ask the question, V is not none. And if we run that, it is now true. Okay? So... These are used, we would compare using is and is not. So that's as far as comparisons, comparison operators. They're quite straightforward. Remember, they only return a Boolean, which is true or false. Even when you're comparing with uh, none, you use is, is not. Now, sometimes you want to do multiple um, comparisons. So, for example, suppose you have, let's say, there was a hat which was red, and um, uh, the, the car is blue. So this is just strings, and we could ask the question, let's check if the hat is red, and the car is, is equals to red also. Now, these are two comparisons we have an equal to and equal to okay but we want to get what's called an and we want to do the conjunction the rule here is whenever we have and and only applies if both uh, let's say all because they could be two or more are true so true if all are true so if we run that we get false, and that's because hat is red is true, car is red is false. That is true and false. And since it is not all of them are true, it will return false. Now, um, we could also use or. 
So let's see. We could say print heart is equals to red or car is not equal to red. So whenever you have or, we are saying or means at least one is true. Otherwise, false. So this is otherwise false. Okay, here. Yeah. Now in this case, what do we expect? The hat is red and the car is not red. So that is true or true. In this case, both are true. All we needed was one of them to be true for it to evaluate to true. But in this case, both of them are true. If we run that, it tells us that it is true because at least one is true. The last thing we could do is we could do a negation of a Boolean. How do we do a, a negation? Well, suppose we say a very simple example, B is true. Print B. If we run that, we get B is true. There, that's what we get. But now we can negate it and we can print not B. We can just invert it. And if we run that, so we get now, so I maybe should have um, a string where I say B and I say not B. So I put not B here. So that we can see where they are. So B is true and not B is false. So you can swap things. And then you can apply that inside inside these. So you can say, you can say print um, not hat equals red, which is the same as saying hat is not equal to red, but I'm just illustrating this here. And if we run that, it says false. Hat equals to red is true. And since it is true, we get not true, it's false. And that's what we get. Now, one, I need to make a point about, uh, so if you bear with me for a few moments, I know we are over time, just need to illustrate a number of things. I should have pointed this out when we did the operators. Sometimes you want to, you want to make a change to a variable. So suppose you had a variable v is equals to 10 and you want to increment that variable. You could say v is equals to the v that you had before plus 1. Right? So we could print out, let's print out v is equals to v and then we print it out again here. So here v is 10, then we increment it, we expect it here to be 11. If we run that, we see that v is 10 and then v became 11, and that's fine. However, there's a better way of doing it than that. There's a shorthand, and the shorthand is to, instead of repeating v, we have an operator for adding on itself. And that operator is v plus itself is equals to 1. And you'll see this in part of the ex one of the exercises, and that gives us the same result. As far as comparisons are concerned, we can actually do double bound comparisons. Notice up here we did comparisons where we only had one boundary. We we're saying x is greater than y. Sometimes you want to check that x is within a certain boundary. So let's do that. So if you have x is equals to some value, let, before we do that, let's start off with a random, the random library. Then we can use that to illustrate this point. The random library in Python, let's look at it from the documentation. The random library is uh, one of my, my best libraries because it's very handy if you want your code to have some uh, randomness in it. So uh, to find that, you go to the standard library. And if you search here, you just do control F or command F and you look for random, you'll find it among the numeric and mathematical modules. You're going to use this for some of the exercises. Now, there are many, many functions in the random library. This module implements pseudo random numbers for various distributions. You don't need to know all that. I just want you to pay attention to two functions in this library. There is, there is the randint and there is the random. 
random. So there are only two functions. I'll write them here. So in order for us to get the random library, we have to import the random library. I would, I'll do it right in here. So import random, but you can do it at the top. Random. Actually, let me do it at the top. That is import random. So once you say import random, you now have access to all the run the functions on that inside that. So we can say random dot random. And what does this do? So this gives us random numbers between zero and one. Okay. So if we have x is equals to a random number, we can print the value of x. Okay, so let's look at that. And that's a random number. And if every time you run it, the number will change. That's a really nice feature, okay? So what we can do is we can test that this is actually true. We can test that x is always between zero and one. So we can print that um, the value zero is less than, so x is less greater than zero and x is greater than one. So this is a, we do a com compound comparison, we could have, instead we should, we would have had to do something like print that x is greater than zero um, and x is, is less than one. But we've replaced it with one, we've replaced it with one call, x that, and if we run that, it tells us it is true. And every time we run that, that should be true because the values we are getting are only between zero and one. So that's just an illustration of how we use this, this, this uh, way of doing things. Now, you don't have to, you might forget to use this as long as you know, you're using the correct thing for using that instead. And then let's look at the rand int. So y is equals to random dot rand int. Now rand int takes two arguments, a and b, which it tells us the bounds we want to take random integers. Now, integers meaning that they can be negative or positive. So we can say we want random integers from minus 10 to 10. And then we can print um, the value of y. When we can print, we can check if they're ever greater than, uh, if they're if they correctly within the bounds. So we can say minus 10, less than, and I think it's equal to, because it includes the, 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 the boundaries y is less than or equals to 10. So if we run that, every time we get a random value, we got minus 6, minus 10, 9, but the evaluation there will always be true. Okay, so we have looked at bool. Whenever we look at logical operators, we always return a bool. And whenever we, 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 there are compound comparisons that we can do, um, and this we can compare values. We've looked at the equal, the, the e checking for equality, double equal, not equal, less than or equal to, less than, greater than or equal to, greater than, is and is not, which are used for none. And then we can combine them using and, or, or not. And we can do combined, um, we can do range comparisons from Python. And I think that's it for this class i don't think i have just a recap from the beginning of this class so what have we looked at we've looked at core io we looked at the print function we looked at the input function we looked at some of the arguments then we looked at variables and we looked at different types there's the integers the floats and we looked at strings we looked at booleans we looked at none we looked at the corresponding functions we looked at int and some of the things you can do with it. We, we used it for binary, we used it for hexadecimal. We looked at basic operators, we addition, subtraction, division. Uh, we looked at modulo, we looked at integer division. And then we looked at logical operators, which have to do with true or false. So that's it for this class. I think I'm done, I don't have anything else. I would ask, please, if you could give me feedback at this link. I want to know how this class went, and I want to know what you think about the way the material has been delivered. Was it too complex? Was it too easy? Um, please go to that URL right now, if you can, and give me some feedback. Just three questions in an additional comment section. Let me know 
How did it go? Was it straightforward? Was I too fast? Did I um, rumble over some material? I know that we had some technical problems in the, in the, in the process of doing this uh, presentation of this class. But it would be very helpful for you to just go on there right now and fill that in. Um, that's all for this class. Thank you so much for attending. I'm going to stop the recording now and then we can have a short discussion if you want.